Oh, hello. Welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuff and occasionally even things. I'm your good friend Bradley, and today is a very pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. And on this pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things, we have many stuff and things to talk about, including upcoming videos, things that you can look forward to on Stuff and Things and Stuff and Things Plays. I'm going to give you a little update on the Iliad so far. I have been reading this. I talked about this in the last Sunday Stuff and Things, and many of you wanted to know what I thought of the book up until the point that I have read it now. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Super Bowl. We have the two final teams that are going to be playing in the game. I want to give you a really cool movie recommendation that Diamond and I just watched recently. And then, of course, we have your questions, comments, and feedback in hashtag AskStuffAndThings. Sunday Stuff and Things, it's sort of a check-in with you. It's me having an opportunity to interact with you, answer your comments, tell you what's going on in the channel, and just have a little chat. So let's get into it. All right, upcoming videos. What can you look forward to on Stuff and Things and Stuff and Things Plays? Well, first off, we have the final review of Esoterica Peace Haven. This will be coming up this Wednesday, and I wanted to especially talk about this, obviously let you know that this video is coming up, but also let you know that this is an interesting review. I have reviewed several Esoterica blends on the channel so far, and I have been really impressed with all of them. This one is a little different, so be sure to check out the final review, which we'll be posting this Wednesday. I did the first impressions video two weeks ago, and I had some concerns, maybe, about this blend. A lot of you commented on that first impressions video. You commented on the Sunday video where I was talking about trying this blend, and it seems as though many of you are big fans of this blend. Not everyone who commented, though, said that they loved it, and I'm very curious to hear your opinions on the final review when it posts on Wednesday. It might be a little bit of a change from the other Esoterica blends, other things that you've seen me review by Esoterica or by Germain in general. So be sure to check that video out this coming Wednesday. Then, I believe next week I'm going to do an update on my guitar playing. I posted that video, was it last week? I can't even remember now. Too many videos. I posted the video where I was comparing my custom shop Fender uh, Telecaster to my, how do, what's the full name? Gibson Original Les Paul Special. And just talking about some of the characteristics of each guitar and many people commented on that video that they would like an update on my guitar playing. I posted that whole nine month guitar journey thing where I had an update every single month. Haven't really updated that recently, so I'm going to post a video about that soon. After that, we have kind of a maintenance slash how-to video. Basically, how to ream your pipe and why you should ream your pipe. I've had a couple people request that, so that'll be coming up as well. And then of course, every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, the Elden Ring series continues. I've recorded over 150 episodes now. It is officially the longest series we have ever had on Stuff and Things Plays. I'm still not tired of the game. I think it's amazing, and many of you have been enjoying it as well, so please check that out every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday on Stuff and Things Plays. Okay, an update on the book I am currently reading. It is The Iliad of Homer. This is the Lattimore translation, which I believe is from 1951. Richmond Lattimore, uh, he was a poet, a translator, and longtime professor of Greek at Bryn Mawr College. And I believe this translation is from 51. Yes, 1951. And I told you when I was deciding that I wanted to read the Iliad, something that, you know, we had read excerpts of when I was in high school, I think, but we never touched it in college, and it's such a foundational piece of literature for the West. I mean, it's about 3,000 years old, or at least it was compiled about 3,000 years ago. It's super influential, super important, and I thought it was just a big blind spot in my knowledge of Western literature. So that's why I picked it up, and I researched all sorts of different translations to figure out which one I should go with, and I'm pretty happy with the Lattimore translation so far. I read the entire introduction, which was pretty lengthy, and had a lot of good information just about the setting and the time period and 
different debates as to whether or not there is a single author, whether there was a Homer who lived back then and compiled this, or whether it's just kind of bardic tradition that was passed down through the centuries and then kind of compiled together. Um, lots of interesting information there, just some context about the major players, the gods and goddesses and the heroes that are mentioned. And then I got into the actual poem. So this is in this is a, a poem version in verse, it's not in prose. So there's still not a super strict meter. It doesn't rhyme. I think the original Greek version or the Greek versions that we have are in free verse. So there's no rhyme, but there was a very specific, um, what was it called? Like dactylic pentameter or something. I can't remember exactly what the original meter was in, in Greek. And this doesn't try to replicate that exactly, but it is free verse. And I think it really works. I wanted something that wasn't too modern sounding. There are a lot of modern transla translations where, you know, there'll even be a character referring to another character as a bitch or something like that. And I didn't really want that. I wanted something that was a little more regal, I guess, in the way it was written. And this seems to be a good combination between ease of readability, but then also having some of that gravitas that you would expect from Homer. So let me just read you the first paragraph. This is book one. I have read five books, four books so far. So not a ton, but I've definitely gotten into it. And book one starts with this. <clears throat> let me get my regal voice here. Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus' son, Achilles, and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans, hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades strong souls of heroes, but gave their bodies to be the delicate feasting of dogs of all birds. And the will of Zeus was accomplished since that time when first there stood in division of conflict Atreus' son, the lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. I like that. I read that intro, intro in a bunch of different versions, and this one really grasped it for me, and I'm really enjoying this. This book, like I said, it's been around for about 3,000 years, or this poem has been around for about 3,000 years, so obviously no spoilers for a 3,000-year-old uh, work of literature, or I, I don't admit that I could make a spoiler for a book that's been around for that long, so I'm going to talk about the plot a little bit. But we all know, or I think most of us kind of know the general story. It's a snapshot of kind of the end of the 10 year long Trojan War when the Greeks led by Agamemnon and um, Menelaus gather a force together to go to Troy to get back Helen who Paris had spirited away. And it's been really fascinating. I really enjoy the characterization Obviously, Achilles, the, they use all the kind of more ancient versions of the Greek's name in this. So instead of Achilles, it's Achilles. Instead of Ajax, it's like Aeus or Aeus, something like that. So that's been a little confusing for me. There are some character names where I'm like, who is that supposed to be? And then I look it up. I'm like, okay, this is just the more, the older version or the more original Greek version of that name. So anyway... It's been really cool to see how the gods and goddesses interact and just like the whole story being laid out and in, in the way it is told, there are all these different conventions. They use epithets for the characters all the time, like uh, fleet-footed Achilles or um, like somebody of the strong spear shaft or gray-eyed Athena, you know, there are all these epithets that they use over and over, and then there are these formulas for scenes where they'll talk about um, a sacrifice to the god or a hecatomb where they're sacrificing a bunch of animals and the way they do it every time where they're cutting the thigh pieces and wrapping it in fat and then putting strips of flesh over top and then burning it and like there's this really cool almost trance-like state you get into reading it where you keep reading these same sort of formulations for different scenes, but then there will be variations on it. Um, it's really cool to get the characterization of the different Greek heroes and the Trojans, the way the gods and goddesses interact. Um, just the whole plot is so, I don't know if I could say amusing, but it's just interesting to see that, and I knew this, but just seeing it portrayed now in the book, the whole thing is kicked off by the fact that Agamemnon has to give back his prize, Chryseis, to a priest of Apollo. And 
because he's pissed off about this, he says that he's going to take Achilles's prize. Uh, Briseis? All these names are going to be confused in my head. And Achilles gets irritated. He has a big speech about why he doesn't like this, and then he goes off to pout by his boats. He's not going to take part in the fighting anymore because he doesn't want to give up his war bride, I guess. Obviously, different conventions, different morality back then. Um, and that sets this whole thing in motion. And so I've gotten through all that. I've gotten through when Thetis or Thetis, Achilles' mother, comes and like, what's wrong, son, as he's crying on the beach? She says she's going to go talk to Zeus so that Zeus will basically punish the Greeks to show them how much they need Achilles so he can gain honor. Um, we go through the whole situation of Odysseus bringing Chryseis back to the priest. Um, we go through the entire catalog of ships, which I, th I found interesting, where it just goes through every single contingent of the Greek forces and where they're from and how many ships they brought and the different heroes, which could be kind of boring, I guess, but it's just interesting because I could imagine this, you know, in 800 BC, a bard reciting this and everyone being like, whoop, whoop, if their hometown was mentioned. Just really fascinating stuff. And it just keeps the, the fact that this is so old and so foundational just keeps coming back to me. This has been around for so long and it's so interwoven into Western culture and Western literature. Just fascinating, I'm loving it so far. I'm to the point now where um, Menelaus had his duel with Paris and he won, but then Aphrodite came and spirited Paris away. And then, I can't remember the Trojan's name, but basically Athena told him to shoot at Menelaus with an arrow, but then she also protected Menelaus from being killed, but that precipitated the Greeks attacking the Trojans because they thought the Trojans had breakin, broken the, uh, the vow that they had, or the truce, and now we're getting into the point where different heroes are showing their might in battle and attacking, the various sides are attacking each other and everything. It's just, it's fascinating. I'm quite pleased with it so far. I'm definitely going to read the Odyssey after I read the Iliad. Not totally sure which translation I'm going to use because some people say that the Latimore translation of the Odyssey isn't as good as his Iliad. I don't know. If anybody has any suggestions, let me know in the comments below. But I just thought I would give you a little update on that. So far, so good. Okay, the Super Bowl is set. We know that it will now be the Kansas City Chiefs against the Philadelphia Eagles. Last week, I think I said I wanted... I wanted the Bengals in the Super Bowl. I wanted them to beat Kansas City, and then I was hoping that San Francisco would beat the Eagles so that they could go to the Super Bowl and get beaten by the Bengals. Obviously, that did not happen at all. It was the exact opposite of that. Um, Brock Purdy got injured for the 49ers, and then they got destroyed by the Eagles. So it is the Eagles, and Kansas City was able to barely get by the Bengals and go to the Super Bowl. I don't like Kansas City. I don't know why. For some reason, I just don't like the Kansas City Chiefs. So now I am rooting for the Eagles to win. Um, I think they have an okay chance. I don't know. The Kansas City has seemed slightly mortal lately. They haven't really been blowing people out that much in the last few weeks. So I'm hoping that the Eagles will be able to beat Kansas City in the Super Bowl. And I guess... <sighs> The fact that the Seahawks are in the NFC, usually I don't want an NFC team to win the Super Bowl, but this time I would actually like the Eagles to beat Kansas City. And then next year we'll see what happens. It looks like the Seahawks are probably going to hold on to Geno Smith. They have a lot of cool young players. They have some nice draft picks, so maybe some good stuff will happen next year. We'll just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. And now, gang, I have a movie recommendation for you. It is a classic movie, a very old movie, and Diamond and I watch it, watched it recently on the Criterion Collection channel, or the Criterion channel, which is a fantastic movie channel, by the way. If you have the opportunity to subscribe to that channel, I definitely recommend you do it. Lots of amazing uh, classic films on there. And this is from 1931, so yes, very, very old film, and it is called M, the letter M, by Fritz Lang. Now, Fritz Lang did some uh, very seminal works during the silent era, Metropolis, you probably heard of, and then he was hanging around in Germany in the 30s, but then left 
pretty soon after the Nazi party came to power because he did not agree with the Nazis at all. And then he came eventually to Hollywood where he produced some other films. We just watched another Fritz Lang film called Manhunt? What was it called? I think it was Manhunt. Let me look that up really quick. Yeah, Manhunt from 1941. And it was kind of this weird precursor to Inglorious Bastards where there's this English gentleman who is a big game hunter who goes, I think it's supposed to take place in 39. And he goes and basically has Hitler in his sights with his hunting rifle and then gets caught. And there's this whole, all these machinations and craziness going on. Really interesting film. You should check that out. But uh, M by Fritz Lang was in 1931. It stars Peter Lorre in one of his first kind of major roles. And the subject matter is just so interesting for that time. It's one of the first uh, sound films that Fritz Lang ever made. In fact, it might have been the very first one. And it's just so good. It's basically about a serial killer, a child murderer, who is Peter Lorre, um, in Berlin and how both the criminal underworld of Berlin and the police are trying to capture him before he kills again. And it's just really fascinating. The way it is shot is really, really cool. He's trying to use a lot of techniques that you wouldn't see um, a lot in film until, you know, a decade or two later. He's trying to do tracking shots. He does some interesting things where he'll kind of Citizen Kaney, where he'll come in through a window and you'll actually see like psh, suddenly the window will like slide open and the camera floats inside. A lot of really cool stuff. Not a ton of, in fact, I don't know if there is any score in the film. There's a lot of long periods of silence. Um, some of the movements kind of sped up just because frame rate wasn't completely set back then. Um, but an amazing performance by Peter Lorre. There's a lot of tension and suspense and it really gets into the psychology of his character. Just a really fascinating film. M by Fritz Lang. You can watch it on the Criterion channel right now, but you can probably find it on Amazon, rent it through Amazon or other services. I highly suggest you check it out. All right, gang, but now it is time for hashtag stuff and things. Remember, if you have a question for me and you would like it answered on the Sunday Stuff and Things, you can tweet at SAT Bradley with the hashtag Ask Stuff and Things. If you are a Patreon supporter, you can write to me via Patreon and go to the front of the line. You can leave a super thanks on this YouTube video and go to the front of the line as well. Or you can leave questions, comments, and feedback on my YouTube videos on YouTube. So let's get into it. We have a question from G on YouTube. Hey Bradley, I'm a recent subscriber and have been enjoying your content. Thank you. Have you ever thought about reviewing music? It would be cool to hear why bands influenced you throughout your life and your current opinions. I have thought of that. Thank you for the question, G. And maybe I will do that. It's something that's kind of hard because if you try to play any of the music, there's a very good chance that the video will be copyright struck, struck and that wouldn't necessarily be the worst thing ever, but sometimes the video will just get blocked entirely. So I wouldn't mind if I had to share revenue on the video, but if the video just gets taken down, that kind of defeats the purpose. So maybe it might have to be things that are not as, I guess, enthusiastically defended. Like if I tried to do something on, I don't know, Led Zeppelin or some huge band like that, I think their their team or their management or whatever is much more likely to strike a video and take it down. But there might be other bands, other things that I could do. I will keep that in mind, definitely. Next, we have some feedback from last week's Sunday Stuff and Things. Um, basically, I think I really hit a nerve when I was talking about manual transmissions or stick shifts and how it seems as though they're falling to the wayside. A lot of people had a lot to say about this, which was interesting. Some of the highlights here, this is from Ryan McFadden. It's sad for me to see stick shifts go the way of the dinosaur. I'm not that old, yet. But for my entire life, I've only owned a manual transmission. I too have always sought them out. My current car is a WRX, before that a Focus ST. My first car was an old Beater 65 Mustang. Whenever I drive my wife's car that's an automatic, it just feels like some of the natural thrill of driving is missing. There's something about being able to row through the gears yourself. And I agree, um, I so rarely drive automatics, but there have been times where if I've gotten into an automatic, 
I use the brake as the clutch pedal accidentally, and I like slam on the brake because I'm thinking in terms of a stick shift. So that's always kind of exciting. Um, next is from Basate's Warrior. I always wonder how much the stick shift is a purely American thing, and Japanese too, as I see. And I think he means here um, the fact that the stick shift is not very popular in America and Japan anymore. But so far, in 30 years of life, I've never seen or heard of a friend or a colleague owning an automatic shift vehicle. Only stick and only manual. And if ever, those that have heard of friends owning an auto shift is a pussy or whatever. So I'm assuming you must be in Europe. I would think so. I uh, had a lot of Europeans saying that, yes, the stick shift is still alive and well in Europe, but maybe becoming not quite as ubiquitous as it was. Next, we have a comment from Robbie. Hello, Bradley. Here in Ireland, cars are slowly going automatic. Most new learners are doing the automatic driving test. I dread the thought of buying a new car in the near future and finding it hard to get a manual. Oh, I hope the Bengals win. Unfortunately, they did not. Next from, now I'm going to ruin this name, I know. Sogo Baugi. Sorry about that. Just a couple of days ago, I happened to watch a video called How Do You Recognize a Murican? Where mostly Europeans said things that tell a person is American. And one of those things were, can't drive a stick. So I guess it's true then. And yes, that probably is very true. Next, from Rubber Ring. Believe it or not, but we had that stuff in the early 80s when I was a kid. He's talking about the slime that I showed you last week, the dusting goo. It was green, sold as a toy, and we called it Smurfsnot. That's, that's Dutch for Smurfsnot. Uh, Smurfs, Smurfinnot? Smurfinsnot, I guess was the Dutch. It was a whole lot of fun because when you stick a finger in the jar and wiggle it about, it makes uh, farting noises. I hate that word. So much fun. And yeah, when I was a kid, what was that called? It was like Gak or something. It was from the Nickelodeon show, or just Nickelodeon general would have the slime, but you could get Gak. I think it was a little more viscous, not quite as like a solid thing as the dusting slime is, but very similar. You get a little jar of it and you could spread it around and it wouldn't get on anything. It would come off, wouldn't leave a residue, similar to this stuff. Next, we did the darn tough, blah, 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 darn tough socks video. Um, I guess that was last week. Yes. Basically just talking about how much I love darn tough socks and wear them all the time. In fact, I think I'm wearing some right now. Yes, I am. Uh, and this is from Searching for the Sound, and a lot of people seem to really love Darn, Talks, Darn Tough Socks as well. Searching for the Sound says, I love that you just released this video. I work for Darn Tough. Dude, super cool. Glad you love our socks. I'm wearing a pair right now, as I always am. Unless, that is, the occasion occurs when I am wearing no socks at all. My favorite sock we make is the Micro Hike Trek in medium weight with full cushion. The tactical and work lines also rule with the added cushioning. The work line has even more added cushioning protect, to protect against the steel toe. I have a pair of the work line I've worn weekly for six years. If they ever break down, they'll get replaced. I love our socks and I'm glad you do too. Also, super happy to see you taking advantage of, as fewer than you'd think do, the strategy of building up a lineup so you never have to buy new socks. The T4022, by the way, breaks down the height, cushioning, model, and weight of the sock in our system. I forget the exact breakdown, and I hope my manager doesn't see this. So that's really cool to hear from someone who works at Darn Tough, and it looked like they were, had been a subscriber for a long time. So very cool. You never know who you're reaching with these videos. Um, this is from Fist of Belial. Fist of Belial. God to your socks. I actually managed to destroy a pair, but it took many, many beatings at my manual labor job to do so. From David Stein. Bradley, you have hit the nail on the head. Smart wool used to be the king of my socks drawer. But darn, darn Tough has taken over the title. These socks are fantastic. They are everything that you say they are. You have provided an accurate and unbiased review. And just to remind everybody, I was not paid in any way by Darn Tough. They did not contact me. I'm just someone who has worn Darn Tough socks for five, six years now, almost exclusively. So cool. Very, very, very cool. Thank you so much for all the feedback, the questions, and the comments. Please keep them coming in. But now, it is time for the very best part of the show, and that is where we thank our Patreon supporters. Remember, if you would like to support the channels on Patreon, there is a link in the description box below, and it is much appreciated because it helps pay for the fancy camera that is filming this video, the lights that are shining upon me, products for review. And every week, we like to shout out the people who support the channels at $25 or more a month. People like... Kirk Crompton. Glenn Dunnington, Jason Buckner, 
Gloria Phillips, MD of the North, David Godru, Nick Papa Giorgio, John Tice, and Finn O'Hagan. And of course, the maniacs, the crazy person who supports the channel at $100 a month, our good friend, Bob McGee. And we will never forget our Hall of Fame member, our dearly departed friend, Peter Straub. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you all so much for watching, for liking, subscribing, commenting, all that good stuff. Please stay tuned for the final full review of Esoterica. I had to look at it for a minute. Esoterica Penzance. This was an interesting one. It does not quite fit in with the rest of the Esoterica blends or the ones that I've reviewed thus far. So please check that out. After that, we'll do a guitar playing update. We will talk about how to ream your pipe and why you should do it. And then every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday on Stuff and Things Plays, you can watch the Elden Ring series. But until next time, until we meet again, I've been your good friend Bradley. You've been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things on a very pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. I'll see you later. Oh, and if anyone knows what this shirt is from, let me know in the comments below.